Ah, December. The month many of us gather around our PCs and edit videos about DOS. Yes, it's December time again. And I know what you're thinking. That's not a PC. That's an Amiga. And it's alright, I've not completely taken leave of my senses. I know that's an Amiga. In fact, it's an Amiga 500 Plus, to be precise. But also, that Amiga 500 Plus you see right there? Yeah, that is also an IBM compatible PC running DOS. No, really, it is. I'll, I'll show you in a second, after we have a quick word from our sponsors, because, you know, we have to pay for these things somehow, right? Today's video is sponsored by PCBWay. Yeah, don't know how hard it is not to pronounce that in a different way. Yes, PCBWay, manufacturer of, wait for it, PCBs. Ah, I know you're all shocked, aren't you? But they also do do 3D printing, CNC machining, and injection molding. And they have a pick and place service as well. They do quite a lot. And of course, they also sponsor videos from the likes of me. There's some seamless advertiser integration. Nobody would have noticed. Anyway, back to the PC slash Amiga. Now, you may have noticed a little box sitting on the side of the Amiga. Many of you would have even recognized that thing as a GVP hard disk. At this point in the Amiga's lifetime, GVP were pretty well known for their hard drive. Because unlike hard drives from, say, Commodore, for example, this hard drive was actually pretty rapid. Admittedly, Commodore's A590 was not overly hard to beat. I mean, that thing was just marginally faster than a floppy drive. And most of that speed advantage was probably that you didn't have to change disks. I know, Commodore implementing a really slow storage system. What a shocker. The most common version of this hard disk was the Impact 2, A500 HD+, as it's got written on the front. And inside its nice wedge-shaped case that blends in with the shape of the Amiga, instead of something that looks remarkably like a shoebox, You've got a fairly nice SCSI controller and a SCSI hard drive. There's even a little external SCSI port on the back so you can chain other SCSI devices on, like, you know, a CD-ROM drive or a scanner, or if you're feeling particularly unique, a network card. Yeah, one day I should probably do a video about SCSI. It's, it's slightly more than people think it is. The other thing this has on the board is some memory sockets so you can add RAM to your Amiga. Now, not just any old RAM. Oh no, what is known as fast RAM. See, the memory system in the Amiga is a little bit odd, and that the memory it's shipped with is what's known as chip mem. This is memory that's accessible by the processor and all the custom chips in the machine as well. The problem is access to this memory is policed by one of the custom chips, Agnes, which means the CPU spends a lot of time not being allowed to talk to memory. Which, you know, if your job's to run code, that, that, that can be a bit of an issue. So, hence we have fast RAM. This is memory that's only accessible by the CPU. So this not only gave you the kind of performance improvement you would expect from having a chunk more memory, but actually improved the CPU performance quite significantly as well, because suddenly the CPU can access memory whenever it likes. Who knew that would be helpful? The version I've got plugged here into my machine, that's not your common or garden Impact 2. Oh no. No, this is the A530. This is the posh version of it. This is where they took the regular hard drive controller, your memory upgrade, and they threw in a processor accelerator as well. With this plugged into the Amiga, instead of your lowly 68000, you've got a 68030. At the time this thing was released, that was a pretty high-end processor. That was the kind of thing you put in the top of the line Macs, even some highly expensive Unix workstations from the likes of Sun or SGI. And it could even easily compete with high-end 386s that were available at the time, which was the fastest processor you could get in a PC at the time this hard drive came out. Obviously, that advantage didn't last for very long, but the 486 came out and, yeah, things changed. So I know what you're thinking. Ah, this is an emulation thing. He's going to run software emulation of a PC. Oh, that's a little disappointing. But do not fear, gentle viewer, for, yeah, this is all going to be hardware-based. Well, for most of it. There is a tiny little bit of software emulation. I'll explain that in a bit. Now, one of the problems for vendors of third-party add-on hardware for the Amiga, well, the Amiga 500, is that there is one edge connector on the side of the machine where all the signals you might want go. There is a trapdoor slot at the bottom that's meant for memory upgrades, but not every signal you need to implement every bit of hardware is there. And once you add one bit of hardware that's taken the edge connector on the side, well, you can't really have any more unless it passes that signal through to another machine. And then you end up with the ever-extending sideways machine problem. TI-99 owners will be very familiar with this one. So, GVP came up with a plan. Rather than having a pass-through thing in an ever-growing machine, sort of ruining the sleek lines of their nicely tapered wedge, they decided they would include an internal slot on the hard drive controller board where you could stick further hardware upgrades. Yeah. And this is where our PC bit comes in. 
for I have here 286. Yep, this is a genuine sort of PC on a card. It's got most of the components you'd expect to see on a PC there. We've got a 286 CPU, we have an IBM compatible BIOS. We've even got 512k of base memory on this bad boy. Now the time this thing came out, the 286 was probably the most common machine there was in the PC world. You had a lot of older IBM XT compatible machines with their 8088 CPUs, you know, giving you a whole 8 bits to play with. But since IBM had released the 80, the 286 had sort of become the standard CPU that most software houses were aiming for. Now not shortly after this board was released, the 386 did come out, but initially they were pretty rare because they, they were quite expensive. Quite a few businesses did upgrade, but you'd upgrade some key workstations or servers rather than swapping the majority of your fleet out. So if you had a 286 at this point in time, you had a fairly decent PC that had run pretty much all PC software out there. Now, looking at this board, you'll notice it's got a few things that the average PC doesn't have, like this edge connector, which is for the bus in the GVP hard drive, which is pretty much like the edge connector of the Amiga. And we got a number of ICs related to doing the interface work with that. There are also some things that are pretty conspicuous by their absence as well. You'll notice, no hard drive controller, no floppy controller chip, no serial port type chips, and no graphics chip. These are all things that the host machine, the Amiga, would have to emulate for the PC card. Now serial ports, pretty easy. You have a couple of control registers you need to emulate, and then essentially you're just shipping data straight through from the PC end to the, to the serial port device in the Amiga OS. Same's even true with the floppy drive access and the hard drive access. You are essentially just mapping read and write requests from the PC end of things to essentially a large file stored on the Amiga's hard drive, and Amiga OS would just manipulate that for you. Access to the floppy drive is a little bit more interesting because there you'd actually pass it through to the media that's in the drive. But again, that's just seeking and putting in getting bytes from the Amiga's floppy drive device. Yeah, you couldn't really pass through the filing system because the Amiga's filing system on floppy disks was very different to how the PC one was structured. In fact, on the same type of disk, you get a larger amount of data on the Amiga version, 880k versus the 720k on the PC formatted disk. Now this card is controlled by an application that runs in Amiga's workbench, which is essentially the GUI operating system for the Amiga. Once loaded, this app would effectively start your PC card. Now on the PC card side of things, what happens is the CPU boots up and starts to read the BIOS just like it would in any other PC, once it's enabled. Now that BIOS has been patched, so things like the disk access routines for the hard drive and the floppy drive, well, they get passed out to the virtual device that the Amiga's providing. Same with the serial ports and parallel ports as well. And that's how DOS would access these devices, they actually go through the BIOS to get to them. The useful thing about this all being done through the BIOS is you can run any version of DOS you like under this one, be it Dr. DOS, MS DOS, whichever DOS you like, because it just goes at the BIOS. You don't need to have patched DOS to do things especially for how this machine works. That was not true for other I am a PC as well offerings from say the likes of Acorn for example with their Master 512. Yes, see last year's December video for details. Where things get a little bit different is the graphics card. This is where things get a bit more complicated and where the Amiga needs a little bit more grunt to, well, get you through. From this point of view, R68030 really helps because it lets us emulate the graphics hardware, and also do lots of other things on the Amiga side of things. It still worked pretty well on a bog standard 68000, so if you took one of these cards and plugged it into an Impact 2, yeah, you, you would be fine. You just wouldn't be doing too many other things in the world of Amiga OS at the same time at a decent speed. Now this system supports this surprisingly large number of graphics display systems. In there it would provide you with CGA, EGA, VGA, as well as Hercules graphics, and a few other ones from the likes of Olivetti and Toshiba. That was a pretty good spread of all the display technologies that were common and some even less common in the world of the PC. But for emulating all of these display systems, life is a bit more complicated for the Amiga, and there's two major reasons for that. Firstly, while there are graphics display calls in the BIOS that you could hook, most DOS games and software didn't use those calls because they were slow, like slower than a particularly slowful sloth who's having very much a low energy day as the baby sloths have been keeping him awake all night. I, I, I feel some sympathy for that sloth. And because of this, software vendors have got into the habit of just 
going at the internal RAM for graphics cards because it was mapped into the PC's main memory map. So essentially, they just start writing bytes in there to control what's displayed on screen and avoid the BIOS calls altogether. So that meant the Amiga not only had to emulate the BIOS calls in case they were used, but also had to emulate essentially the hardware of the card as well, mapping blocks of memory into where they'd be expected for those different display types. And this is where the second area of complexity comes in, in that the Amiga and the PC both do their displays in a very different way. The Amiga uses what's known as planar mode for all its graphics displays. This is where, essentially, instead of just writing a byte into a location in memory to represent the colour of a pixel, what happens is you have a number of planes. When the Amiga writes one byte into memory, what it's doing is setting the value of eight pixels in that plane. So, for example, the plane red. It then continues to write all the pixels out for the red plane. It will then write all the pixels out for the blue plane. Again, eight pixels at a time. Now, the Amiga took this approach because it made life a lot easier for the accelerated 2D hardware that was on that for doing all the sprites and copper processor and all of that sort of stuff. Now, the PC was never built to do gaming. It didn't have sprite hardware, or in fact really much in the way of display hardware at all. The CPU just chucks bytes into memory. And, for example, if it's in a 4-bit display mode and you write 8 bits, or 1 byte, it will set the va colour value of 2 pixels. This is what's known as chunky mode. And this leaves our little PC emulator with a bit of a problem, because it has to go from chunky pixel mode, take all of that in memory, and then rewrite everything as planar pixel mode so the Amiga can actually display it from its chip memory. So this makes essentially the graphics the only CPU-intensive bit of this. We also have some issues with the number of colours that can be displayed in some of these modes. Now, for your CGA, EGA, yeah, everything's fine. It's a pretty low colour count on all of those. Where things get more complicated is for VGA, because in theory, that thing allowed up to 256 colours at once. Essentially, one byte, one pixel. Now, our Amiga 500, in fact, all the Amigas at this point in time, yeah, they don't have a 256 colour mode. They can do modes like 16, 32, 64. They're the only ones they do straight in hardware. So, our VGA colour palette is constrained somewhat. Luckily, the PC did have the idea that you could have a lower number of colours on screen because not every VGA card had enough RAM to support all the display modes in 256 colours. Speaking of display modes, that fetches up another little problem with our emulation system here. In that the Amiga 500 was, well, Designed for a much lower refresh rate monitor that would handle lower resolutions, it did have higher resolution modes, but unless you had a multi-scan monitor, that thing would flicker like no one's business. I mean, it was horrific. Now, luckily, they did sell add-on devices known as flicker fixes, so you could use those higher resolution modes in the Amiga without wanting to rip your own eyes out. And because this thing used the irregular Amiga display, if you had a flicker fixer, like this machine happens to, well, it would flicker fix the modes for the PC too, so when we fire this thing up, we'll be able to use some display modes that would have just been spectacularly unpleasant on the original hardware without having a flicker fixer installed. Speaking of which, it's about time we fire this thing up so you can have a look at it. After all, we spent quite a while explaining how this thing works and also the history of GVP. The card comes with its own boot floppy, so you can just boot up straight into that and get access to the PC emulation application. Now, mine didn't come with the original floppy disk, but I did manage to find a disk image online. I stuck that on the USB stick, and there that is in that little external GoTech that you've seen kicking about. There's a config utility that lets you set up most of the system, including a nice little set of sliders that let you choose how much memory the thing's got. I'll come back to that later. You can also configure other things, like the keyboard map, for example. Of course, being an emulator that comes with, you know, a hard drive, you'd expect it to be able to be installed to the hard disk, and of course you can. You can boot up off your hard drive as normal, pop in the boot disk, and then you can run the hard drive installer from there. Now, admittedly, it's not a nice hard drive installer. Um, as install utilities go for Amiga OS, this one's actually just, you know, execute a shell script. But... It's soon done its job, and we've installed it to DH0. Now, actually, I already have this installed on a different hard drive. I'm just installing it to DH0 so you can see it doing it, because, you know, I've already used this thing. Right, I bet you're keen to see this thing actually running. Now, time to start the emulator. Oh, no, what's gone wrong with this? 
So this is future video editing me cutting into the video here. Yeah, so what you're seeing is the fact that retro sometimes goes wrong, and by sometimes I mean fairly regularly, and usually you fix this stuff and you move on. With this particular emulator being essentially mostly a series of custom ICs and a processor and some RAM, I have not been able to figure out what the fault on this thing is at all. I mean, the fault might actually be with the Amiga. So prior to me deciding, okay, it's time to capture the actual footage for this, this thing had been working fine for like days. And I'm actually about a week or so into producing this video, so I've done the script, I've recorded most of the dialogue you've already heard, I've edited together most of the video sequences. This was just my final little bit to capture the footage of the emulator itself. I've even got all the content set up in the hard drive image for this. I had a copy of Windows Free there, so you could see it doing that. I even had a copy of Outrun for DOS installed, just so I could show Pete, really. You may have noticed that Outrun features in these videos a lot, because it really amuses Pete, so I'd put them in here. Now, I could have probably have cut this video together and borrowed some footage from someone else and made it all look as if it works, but actually, I think it's fairly important to keep in the fact that this stuff sometimes just goes, well, wrong. And today, it went wrong in a way that I cannot fix on a reasonable time scale. So I'm afraid you're just gonna have to take my word for it that this once worked, and this Amiga was once a PC, as well as an Amiga. Now, it is a potentially broken Amiga, and a definitely broken PC. Now, when I was showing off what this thing could do, you saw me playing around with the memory sliders, and I said, I'll come back to that later. Well, now is later, and I'm coming back to it. Memory at this point in the PC's existence is a mess. And all these problems can be traced back to the root of when the PC was first created. IBM essentially got a small group together and they were told to use off-the-shelf parts. Nothing complex, nothing custom, not even so much as a single ULA. So this led to them using an 8-bit microprocessor, which very much limited the amount of memory the PC could address at once. In fact, it could only ever address 64K in one go, and essentially it would page through the amount of memory it had. So I think the initial model shipped with 512K, and so essentially it would access that memory in a series of 64K pages. Now this paging system left us with an addressable total limit of 640K, typically referred to as base memory. Now of course, as the PC got more complicated and got faster processors, 640K was not enough for everybody. Now, given the nature of the PC market by the time the 286 is introduced, no one's really in charge of it anymore. Yeah, IBM set some initial standards, but there were plenty of clone manufacturers doing whatever the heck they wanted. Which meant when it came to ways to add memory to the PC, well, we didn't just end up with one, did we? Now, at one point we were stuck with essentially two ways of doing it, expanded memory and extended memory. Expanded memory essentially lived in the memory just space just after the 640K and would eventually become known as high mem And this block of memory DOS could use for essentially parking in drivers and other TSRs so they didn't sit in the main 640K and, you know, use up space that DOS applications wanted to use. The problem is, as time gone on, one meg, again, just wasn't enough. So this is where we turn to the expanded memory. Initially, this was done with an ISA card with some RAM on that you plug into one of the slots. But later on, we'd see memory sockets added directly to the motherboard for this. And in order to access this memory, you'd need a special memory manager that would sit there and essentially mediate access to the RAM for the application. Well, the first one of these was Lotus Memory Manager, developed by the same people who brought us Lotus 123, and included it with their spreadsheet so you could have more RAM for your spreadsheet. As this was a fairly popular add-on, other DOS applications started to require it and use the Lotus Memory Manager, and eventually Microsoft would develop their own. Now for our card, it's got its own memory manager, which allows it to make use of the extended memory that the Amiga is offering it. And that comes on the DOS formatted disk that came with your card. So you load that memory manager, and that then allows the DOS environment to make use of that RAM. Eventually Microsoft would ship their own memory manager with DOS known as M386, giving DOS applications access to expanded memory right out of the box. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, that's at least all memory situations sorted out, no, there's one more thing you need to know about that the card had to take care of, and that's known as protected mode. Now, the initial processor that they used in the PC, the 8088, only had what we later referred to as real mode, i.e. this 64K paging mode, which the 286 had to implement, or no DOS code would have worked on it. But Intel also introduced what is known as protected mode. Now, it didn't get the biggest use on the 286 because it did have some interesting flaws they later fixed in the 386. But they did still have to support it on this card. 
Now, one of the key advantages of protected mode is it meant that the processor could access all the memory in a continual address space, so you didn't have to page block in and out and essentially reference memory within the page. You could just go all the way up through the memory stack, which is pretty handy. One of the things that took advantage of this, which was really important for the card to support, was Windows 3. Windows 3 could run in either real mode, using 64K paging, or if you had a 286 and wanted it to run at a reasonable speed, it could run in protected mode. So again, protected mode is something this card has to support. Also, a number of DOS games need it as well. If you ever used DOS G4W as a loader before your game started, yeah, that sat there and essentially put the chip into protected mode so that it could use all the memory addressed in a linear fashion. Again, this has become way more popular with the 386. Now, I probably should point out, at this point in time, if there was a game available for the PC, you could pretty much guarantee there'd be a better version for the Amiga anyway, so this card probably didn't get used heavily for gaming. Maybe just for the odd title that wasn't available for the Amiga. Mostly you were going to be using this stuff for doing business stuff, like Lotus 123 or WordPerfect, or, if you were feeling adventurous, running Windows. All in all, I'd say if you had this card back in the day, you'd have been pretty pleased with it. You would have ended up with a pretty competent PC, just floating on the side of your actually really quite good Amiga with its 68030, well at least in this case. Although, you did need a fair amount of memory, because you need enough RAM for your Amiga applications, you also need enough for the PC environment, so the PC gets some extra memory, and then you need a bit on the side to be, well essentially the graphics memory as well, so that Amiga can do the sort of chunky to play the conversion. And again, you're using display memory in the chip RAM as well for the screen display. Now, what I've not mentioned is, although this is one of the few hardware add-ons that ever appeared for the mini slot inside the JVP hard drive, this hardware wasn't created by GVP. Yeah, this is actually a relay out of an existing PC hardware emulator that pretty much everything I've said about this hardware emulator would be true on that version as well, created by a company called AT Once. The difference is, if you wanted to install that thing, you pull out your 68000 processor from your machine, shove this daughter board in, and then stick your 68000 processor back into the daughter board. So at least it was an internal expansion. Of course, for that thing to be of much practical use, you'd also need to add more RAM to your Amiga using the edge connector on the side of the machine. And also, let's face it, DOS could work off a floppy disk, and you could run applications off a floppy disk, but nobody did. Everyone used a hard drive with DOS. And a lot of things were built really with that in mind. There was an expectation that you would have a hard disk to install to, so if you didn't, there was a lot of DOS stuff wouldn't work for you. So with the fact that to use this thing you required both a memory upgrade and a hard disk, well, the JVP route always made way more sense to me than the pull out your CPU and shove in a daughter board approach. Now, unsurprisingly, there aren't detailed sales statistics information for this thing. Yeah, who would have thought? But I can't imagine this sold in huge volume. After all, it is an add-on for an add-on. So the potential market of those there to buy it was relatively small. Also, the Amiga very much hit a price point with the A500 that was a lot lower than the PC by a country mile. And most people who bought an Amiga bought it because they wanted an Amiga and they didn't want a PC. So you had to find someone who wanted an Amiga, but also needed a PC for some other stuff who also had a GVP hard drive as well. So it is a relatively small market. It's also worth mentioning that Commodore themselves had a hardware PC card like this one as well, intended to go into the A2000. And the A2000 had a bit of an advantage if it wanted to pretend to be a PC, in that Commodore had fitted the A2000 out the factory with a number of ISA slots. Now those did absolutely nothing until you added the PC bridge board, at which point, suddenly, your PC bridge board has a number of ISA slots that it can access, including the ability to put in a standard VGA card. This meant you no longer had to emulate all the graphic stuff in software, so everything was a little bit more responsive, but also, you could have 256 colours. So, if you wanted a one Amiga and one PC all in one box combination, the A2000 and the PC bridge board it probably was a better option. Well, that about wraps it up for our A500 slash PC. If you got all the way to this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, why not click the special button YouTube installed to indicate that to its algorithm, the little thumbs up. You could also share it with friends as well that you think might like it. And of course, if you really want to help out the channel, you could click the subscribe button, because that apparently makes a giant difference to the YouTube algorithm for, you know, telling people that this video actually exists.